Good morning, friends, and welcome to another edition of First Friday Facebook Live. Um, today we are going to be talking about schooling fish, because, you know, back to, back to school. It is yeah. time to go back We're to doing school. It. You yep. should be in school right now if you're under age 18, right? We went there, yeah. yeah. So, sorry, we couldn't help ourselves, but um, our, in all seriousness, schooling fish are a very interesting and seemed timely topic, as many of our younger friends should be headed back to start their academic school year. Um, so today we are joining you from our schooling fish tank on the second floor in our temperate gallery. There are so many things that we could discuss um, with schooling, but today we are going to focus on the basics. That being said, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. This tank behind me is full of blueback herring and is quite mesmerizing, I must say. Herring are a very important local species that make seasonal migrations up and down some of our local rivers. And they are a great example of a fish that spends a lot of time in a school. So sit back, relax, enjoy the fish, and let's learn about why fish swim together. Are they a school? Are they a shoal? What's the difference? I don't know. Nick, what's the difference? Let's get into it. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to start out with some basics like Taylor was saying. What is a school? So there are several terms that can be used to describe a school, or excuse me, a group of fish that are swimming together. The three most common terms are an aggregation, a shoal, and a school. And they're often used interchangeably, but if you want to get technical, it's kind of like squares and rectangles. So all squares are rectangles but not all rectangles are squares. Just let that sink in for a second. <laughs> Confused yet? All right, let's break it down. We'll start broad and then we'll get a little bit more specific. We may also recruit a few friends who are off camera right now <laughs> to give us a little bit of a visual demonstration. Okay, let's start with an aggregation. An aggregation is a collection of fish that have gathered together in a specific location. An aggregation can contain various species of various sizes and are loosely gathered together, usually due to a resource uh, available in that specific location. Think foraging for food or lingering around good nesting sites. So we're, we're in aggregation. We are aggregating in the same area. Mm. All right, aggregating. Aggregation. Check. Thank you, Cease. school. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, when an aggregation starts to interact and respond to each other in a social way, this becomes a shoal. A shoal can still contain various species and different sized fish. Uh, a shoal is still somewhat loose in organization, but they move and adjust their behavior to remain close to the group. They are aware of the other members in the shoal. All right. All right, shoal, we are a shoal. Shoal cease. <laughs> okay, now when a shoal becomes more tightly organized and the members start swimming and moving in the same speed in the same direction, they are a school. Schools of fish are usually the same species and are often roughly the same size and age. In fact, they can be offspring from the same parents, otherwise known as a cohort. That's a fancy word for brother and sister fish in the same group. <laughs> they move together, remain evenly spaced, and precisely bob and weave to avoid obstacles or to catch prey. It can almost seem as if they are of one mind. All right, suspend your belief. We are all the same size and species, okay. <laughs> School, cease. Woo, did it. Did it. <laughs> so now you understand, right? Thanks for the yeah. help, <laughs> guys. We appreciate that. That was Anthony and Emily, special guests on Facebook Live today. <laughs> so now, why do fish actually school? Well, this could really be its own Facebook Live topic, and maybe we will do a deep dive down the road into why schooling fish actually school. Uh, but for now, we'll give you the short version. 
Why do they school, All Taylor? Right. What's the big deal? Well, schooling has many advantages. One that people are probably most familiar with is predator avoidance. By swimming in a large group, schooling fish can fake out predators into thinking they are much bigger um, or just to confuse predators in general. Most predators will stalk and hunt uh, one fish until they either catch it or they don't. Um, chasing down just one fish in a school is an almost nearly impossible task. Um, there are some other advantages to swimming in a school. Um, scientists have also proven that swimming in a school reduces stress. Um, and can increase ease of communication, which can also help with predator evasion. Um, scientists believe that due to the hydrodynamics of many fish swimming closely together, schooling may save energy. Um, if you think about geese flying in that V formation, there it is. This is yet to be scientifically proven um, because it's difficult to replicate um, natural schooling behavior in a laboratory setting. Think tank walls. Um, other advantages are reproduction. We talked a little bit about shark reproduction last month, uh, so let's talk a little bit about schooling fish reproduction. It's a lot easier to find your mate if your entire community is in one spot at all times. Um, it may also be easier to navigate to breeding grounds as a large group rather than as one individual fish. Um, the last major advantage has to do with Nick's favorite topic, eating. Schooling, uh, swimming in a school can increase chances of finding and catching food. With more eyes searching for food, the group can locate prey more quickly. And because members of the school are so in tune with each other, when one fish demonstrates feeding behavior, the rest of the school will quickly learn where their dinner is found. Um, scientists have also found that the spacing of schooling fish can increase their ability to capture small prey items like copepods. That's no easy and task. if you're curious, there's a very cool visual that you could find online with herring. Um, so there are kind of two types of schooling fish. There are obligate and facultative. So another way of classifying schooling fish has to do with whether they school all of the time or just some of the time. So obligate schoolers such as tuna or herring spend all of their time into school and may actually become agitated if they are separated, just like Nicholas. And also, and just a quick message, Taylor. <laughs> Kids, be obligate schoolers be all obligate the time. obligate schoolers. Hang out together. Okay. Um, in general, obligate schoolers are also smaller fish um, that primarily school to avoid predators. Think herring. Um, so you may also uh, understand why they might be nervous when their cohort leaves them behind. Mm -hmm. That's not very nice brother and sister fish. No. no. Um, Facultative schoolers, uh, such as Atlantic cod or some of the species of jack that live in our giant ocean tank, school only some of the time. So for example, fish will often come together when they are preparing to reproduce. It can be hard for larger, more mobile species to find mates when they are ready to have offspring. So gathering together can provide them with this opportunity. These facultative schools of reproducing fish will typically gather around a prominent underwater feature, like a boulder reef, for example, um, at the time that coincides with ideal tides and currents. And once they are done with their reproductive behaviors, they will disperse and may never school together again. Wild. Whoa. Yeah. Um, there are some ways that you can define schooling fish beyond facultative, facultative and obligate. And Nick's going to talk a little bit about that now. Sure am. Schooling structure. Okay. Let's All get right. Into it. Yep. So we've talked about, like Taylor was saying, different ways to define a school of fish as well as reasons why they might school. And now we'll try to describe to you guys ways to classify the actual structure of a school. Why would we possibly want to classify the structure of a school of fish, you ask? Well, gaining a better understanding of schooling dynamics and exactly how fish make this all happen, um, other animals for that matter as well, um, can really uh, help humans in our quest to move around our world in a more efficient way, more efficient ways in general. Um, moving more efficiently means that we uh, require less energy as individuals, uh, but it also means that we require less energy in the vehicles that we use to move around as well. Uh, and like we have talked uh, before about in past uh, Facebook Lives, once less energy, twice. once or twice, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, less energy means a more stable climate and it means healthier oceans, which is really what Taylor and I and the New England Aquarium are really all about. Yeah. Protect the blue planet, people. Okay. It's aggressive. Take it down. All right. Back to the structure <laughs> of a school of fish. While the number of fish in a school can often complicate our ability to define any structure, 
you know, looking at this school behind us, you might not really be able to recognize at first glance that there's any sort of structure there. But scientists have developed some technology uh, that, that's helping them out with this, such as computer modeling and acoustics that actually help them to define the structure of a school. One of the classifications that they developed is in regard to the density of a school. Density is basically the amount of something divided by a particular unit of space or volume. For example, you're already smiling because you know it's coming, right? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Nick prefers the density of green M&Ms in a given bag of M&Ms to be high, which would mean more green M&Ms for Nick per bag. <laughs> I think you get the picture. Anyway, the tank of herring behind us is dense enough to really show off the schooling abilities of these fish, but not too dense to affect their health or their comfort level. Out in the ocean, the density of a school might not always be consistent throughout, and it's usually most dense in the front of the school as opposed to the back of the school. Also, it might change depending on the size of a given individual in the school or the reason why the fish are schooling in the first place. If fish are avoiding predators, the school may become more tightly packed together and therefore denser per unit of space like this school right here. <laughs> okay. Another classification to describe the structure of a school is called its polarity. Chemistry fans might recognize that word. The polarity of a school refers to the extent to which the fish are all pointing in the same direction. <laughs> to calculate this for the whole school, the orientation of a school member is compared to the overall group and then averaged together, which is kind of complicated. In more basic terms, a school with high polarity means everyone is swimming in the same direction, such as when they are being chased by a predator or pushed by ocean currents. A school with low polarity means that fish are moving in their own different directions, perhaps while they're foraging for food kind of along the bottom of the ocean. Visualize our shoal er earlier. That's right, yeah. that, that great shoaling Low example polarity there. <laughs> that we uh, represented here, yeah. yeah. Now there are several other ways to classify a school structure, but we'll leave it to the researchers for now. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to a great case study that Taylor's gonna talk to us about. Mm -hmm. Again, these guys behind us, the herring that are hanging out in our schooling fish tank. Take it away, Taylor. Awesome. As we mentioned earlier, the tank behind us is full of blueback herring, about 2,200 blueback herring to be precise. Um, you probably wouldn't believe it just looking into the tank. Um, herring are an obligate schooling fish and stay together in these big schools at all times. During long migration, smaller schools of herring will join together and make up massive schools. And one scientist estimated that there could be approximately three billion fish in a single school. Whoa. Whew. Yeah. Uh, herring are known for their extremely precise spatial arrangement. This allows them to maintain almost constant cruising speeds. And this is a characteristic that you can observe in the tank behind me. Herring in here are constantly zipping around the tank. Um, the only time I ever see them break this perfect stride is when our aquarist puts food in the exhibit. Mm, that would distract me too. Yeah. Um, they get very excited and jump and splash, but it's really something to see. Um, but they pretty quickly go right back to the regular rhythm of the, um, that they had before the initial excitement. Um, they can also use this precise movement along with excellent hearing to keep a safe distance from predators. You've probably seen those images of massive schools just perfectly avoiding sharks. Um, herring are somewhat unique in that they are an anadromous fish. This means that they start life in freshwater and move out to saltwater once they are big enough to make the journey. Um, we collect herring with a special permit from Mass Fish and Wildlife and we catch them as juveniles as they run for the ocean. So when a large school of herring swim downstream at the same time, this is called a herring run. There you go. There you go. As adults, blueback herring return to the swift freshwater rivers where they were born to then spawn themselves, which is very cool. Um, but this has become a, somewhat of a challenge due to human activity. So we're going to talk a little bit about conservation for schooling fish, maybe starting with those herring. That's a great idea. Yeah, let's get into that. So when we build dams and bridges over these rivers, uh, in the manner that Taylor was just kind of describing, altering these waterways, we can block access to these spawning rivers for fish like herring. And if the herring can't spawn, there are no babies, and this means no more herring. So it's sort of cutting off the supply to that population. Um, protecting and maintaining these important habitats is one way to ensure 
the future of this species, uh, species and other species that travel up and down these waterways. Blueback herring are facing another challenge that many species of schooling fish, 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 whoa. <laughs> I know, it's a We've been saying twister. that word a lot during this, so <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, they are facing another challenge that a lot of other species of schooling fish also face. They are also overfished. Now, you will probably recognize the names of many types of schooling fish. Herring, sardines, anchovies, tuna. These are all fish that we eat, right? I certainly have yes. before. Yep. Yes, <laughs> Schooling fish are often caught by commercial fishermen using a type of net called a persane net. Think of this net as almost like a big drawstring bag. When the net is open wide, it can take in huge amounts of fish at one time. But as the fisherman pulls at the net, the drawstring pulls tight, trapping all the fish inside of the net. And this method can virtually deplete an entire school in just one pull of that persane. Uh, now, schools of fish won't necessarily join up with other schools of fish. So when their numbers are depleted, uh, they can be more susceptible to predators as well, and it can be more challenging for them to find food and more difficult to find a mate as well. All of these things can make it harder to rebuild their population, and this could happen after just one fishing event, event uh, depending on the location and the size of the school. Whew, wow. So uh, fortunately, it's very easy to prevent overfishing from happening. By choosing sustainable seafood, you can support fishermen that are making more ocean-friendly choices, including the type of fish that they are catching and the methods that they use to fish for them. We encourage you to find, uh, we encourage you to, uh, find out how your fish was caught and whether it is sustainable the next time you're thinking about enjoying a nice seafood dinner. You can also support legislation and legislators that support science-based fisheries management, which is really, really important. This can help create policy that prevents things like overfishing or allows vulnerable populations time to recover. And just a quick note, in our uh, IMAX theater, which is on our campus here, there's actually a public service announcement that's running right now talking about the importance of fisheries management. So if you come to watch an IMAX movie, you, have, you will have the opportunity to actually view that public service announcement. We definitely encourage you to do that. Okay. Should we tie things all together here, Taylor? Let's do it. Okay. So you might be wondering, is this the only tank where I can see schooling fish? Huh. I'm so glad you asked. I uh, the answer is no. This no? is not the only location where you can see schooling fish here at the New England Aquarium. Um, we have schooling fish literally all over the building. In our freshwater gallery, you can see red belly piranhas and cardinal tetras. In our shark and ray touch tank, you can check out the count stingrays. In our giant ocean tank, you can see numerous species of schooling fish. In fact, it is a great location to watch a shoal become a school and go back to a shoal again. You can actually see that in action in Whoa. the giant ocean tank. Um, you can see look downs and snappers and surgeon fish schooling in that exhibit. Our favorite, however, might be our smallmouth grunts. Small mouths. They have little mouths, small they do. Mouths. Um, but that's not the reason they're our favorite. Of the approximately 1,000 fish in that exhibit, about 500 of them are smallmouth grunts. You really can't miss them. They form a large school of silver and yellow striped fish about halfway up the giant ocean tank spiral. Um, why are they our favorite then? Well, um, because they are raised as part of our larval fish program. In an effort to collect fish more sustainably ourselves, We've worked with Roger Williams University to become um, better at growing more of our fish in-house. Um, you can learn more about this and see some of our juvenile lookdowns, another schooling fish, on the first floor of the main building in our larval fish exhibit across from our African penguin. So keep your eyes out now that you know what a school and a shoal and an aggregation are. You can look for them all over the building here at the New England Aquarium. That's right. I think at this point, what we'd love to do is see if we have any questions from our audience. Again, there's lots of things we could talk about with schooling, so feel free to ask away. You do. Awesome. What is the biggest kind of schooling fish? Whoa. Whew. Wow. Biggest kind of schooling fish. <sighs> or how big can schooling fish get? So. Most of those obligate schoolers are smaller species. Um, things like herring are probably the largest of those, but there are animals that will come together periodically in school. Think of that facultative. So um, I think mantas do this. Manta rays are like the size of a 
car. They're massive animals. Um, large species of sharks as well. I know great hammerheads will come together for mating purposes um, and school together during um, mating season in really particular places out in the ocean. Can you think of anything bigger than? I can't. I guess I don't <laughs> really know if whale sharks actually aggregate to spawn. Yeah, I'm not sure. They would be the biggest fish in the ocean. They, but, they but Taylor gave a great example there of, of animals like mantas that are really big. So I think there's almost no limit to the size of a schooling fish in relation to the fish that are I think maybe in the, the ocean, biggest obligate schooler might be something like a killer whale. Sure. They hang out Good together example. in a really specific type of school called a pod, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty cool. And killer whales are really massive animals and they have to be in that social group um, because not only do they use it for all of those other advantages, but they also get that social aspect. So that would be my guess for biggest obligate schooling fish. But that was a good question. Yeah. Though. yeah. You answered the next question too, which is, are fish the only marine animals that school? Oh no, yeah, Taylor gave just a great example mm -hmm. of another type of uh, marine animal. That, yeah, that so orcas well. are yeah. technically a whale, um, so not a fish, um, but they do hang out together and there are lots of marine animals that will hang out in groups. I don't know if it's technically called a school for something like a group of Oh no, that's a good point. I think we, what do we call those? I think we call them, well, we call whales pods, right? Mm -hmm. Usually? Yeah. A group? I wonder if seals have a different name. I don't know. Woo, you guys are, you have some questions. really excellent well, we've questions got, this we've morning. We've got something to ask our marine mammal department Yeah, today, we do. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, good one. And we'll post it when we find out. Uh -huh. <laughs> Can schooling provide opportunities for larger predators predators to gulp many fish at once. Such a good yes. question. So yeah. we were actually thinking of doing a Facebook Live series where we just talk about cool strategies that predators use in order to catch schooling fish because yes, they absolutely do. Should we like sneak peek real quick? Talk yeah. about one of my favorites? Sure, go okay. for it. Yep. Um, bubble netting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So whales do this. Typically, um, large species of whales like humpback whales and other baleen whales are pretty solitary animals. They don't hang out together in large groups um, too often. The exception is when they do this phenomenon called bubble netting. Um, so bubble netting, a group of whales will get together. There will be a designated bubble blower. So Whoa. one whale will swim around, that's you? Okay. They'll swim around the outside of the school blowing bubbles out of their blowhole. As the bubbles rise to the top, it looks very similar to a net. So the school, in response to that, swims a little bit closer together. Then there's another whale that's the designated vocalizer. So if you're the bubble blower, I guess I'm the vocalizer. Oh, I changed my mind. I want to be the vocalizer. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, you would then swim underneath the school and yell in whale. Very good at yelling. Yes, excellent. Um, then all of the schooling fish are scared really close to the top. Uh, and then all of the whales go down underneath the school and swim up through the middle with their mouths wide open and get lots and lots and lots of delicious fish. Such an amazing strategy, right? It's pretty cool, yeah. And you can still see that happening on whale watches, leaving from right outside the aquarium uh, for the rest of this season, which uh, goes for at least another month and a half or so, I right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so, um, for sure. So yes, there are some very cool strategies and tune back in when we talk about cool predator strategies That's for schooling fish. That's just the tip fish. of the iceberg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions today? Does pollution in the oceans affect schools different than it affects individual fish? Wow, what a thoughtful question. You know, I think that it would depend on a couple things. One of the things might be the type of pollution. Mm -hmm. So let's say it's a chemical pollution or something that or sort of- Or an oil spill. Or an oil spill, right? Yeah. Something that that is uh, in more of a liquid form in the water. Schools that would encounter those areas of pollution could be highly affected versus pollution that might be more, uh, I don't know, like, a, like an object, like a piece of plastic that's floating around in the ocean before it actually breaks down into microplastic. Larger debris, pieces of plastic, other debris just floating around might just happen to affect animals in that general area. So if a school came across an object like that, they might be impacted. But those chemical sources or, or oil spills like we were talking about can certainly spread over wider areas and can often encompass areas where schooling fish like to spend time, whether they're foraging or reproducing or for whatever reason. And so it can have a major impact on them while they're traveling through those spaces, yeah. 
So, yeah. Yeah. Good question. Any more? Um, are there any land animals that mimic schooling behavior? Absolutely, there are. Yeah. Um, well, Taylor hinted on um, <laughs> birds that fly in patterns like these, right, as they travel around. So that would be an example. I don't know about you, but the first thing that came to my mind was thinking about a lot of uh, terrestrial mammals that make migrations across the plains of Africa, and they travel in these big groups, right? Um, and um, that's for the same reasons that we talked about with schooling fish, staying together to avoid predators, looking for food sources while they're making those journeys. And very often, those journeys are to get to a place where they can reproduce or where there is a known food source available for them or things are like water uh, water sources as well, which can be really important for land mammals. So I don't know yeah. if you thought of any other I would say ideas. that there are definitely lots of land animals that use similar strategies to schooling for the exact same reasons that schooling fish school. So I for think sure. you nailed it. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Awesome. Okay. I think that is the end of our questions. If you guys think of a question after we are done, after we're signed off today, post it. We will answer it. For the ones that we were a little iffy on, we'll look it up and post it too. Um, I think that brings us to the end. Nick, do you have any last words for our Facebook Live crew today? It certainly does. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Our super fan, Carol, <laughs> my mother, Anne. <laughs> Do you have any other shout outs that you want to give? I, I think that's enough for today. Okay, all yeah. right, great. Thank you guys very much for tuning in on our first Friday Facebook Live. Stay tuned for next month where I believe we're going to be talking about jellies, but take a look at our website for more information about what that topic will be. We will see you guys in a month. Can't wait. Have a great rest of your Friday and a great weekend. And happy school year. Woo! <laughs>